I'm Charlotte, this is Time I'm Tries to Read and I'm back with some books I bought. I'm going to be really super quick. I know I said I wasn't going to buy any books, blah, 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 blah. Um, what I've been doing is what I've done before and I've talked about before, which is when I've not been reading as well, I tend to buy more books and what I'm actually trying to do is buy more time to read the books that I've got, but I, I just seem to sort of compensate one for the other. Then I get really, really miffed because I've got loads of amazing books that I haven't sort of haven't got time to read. So then I buy some more. Um, I'm, when I'm at my happiest reading place, I'm not necessarily buying. So um, these were sale books that I got in W. H. Smith's, which is like a stationer's cross bookshop, but has some really actually it has some really nice stuff in it. So this is I think this is a 2012. Yeah, 2012 book, The Newlyweds, by Nell Freudenberger. Uh, <coughs> sorry. If you can believe it, I have another cold. <laughs> I don't have a cold, I have like a chesty thing. Um, yeah, it's, don't feel like you need to send, like, me, send me multivitamins or anything. This is just what happens when you have a child in school for the first time. So we have just, me and Idris, have just been non-stop ill since Boxing Day, more or less, with one thing or another. Stephen has had one cold that he caught over Christmas and that's it. So uh, yeah, anyway, um, The Newlyweds. So this is about a couple that meets online. Um, Amina lives in Bangladesh and George is from America. They decide to get married. So she comes over and they start a real sort of suburban existence together. So it's not an arranged marriage, but it's kind of playing on the idea of an arranged marriage. And um, they, they've come to the marriage with secrets, which then start to sort of eat away at them. And they, I think they have to sort of make a decision whether they're going to be together or apart. And it's got really good reviews. Um, Kiran Desai, whose book Inheritance of Loss I bought recently, and Anne Patchett, who I've never read, but um, I always feel I should. And I might be able to now because, I'm uh, sorry if I could keep leaning down to my book bag. Uh, I bought her, her sort of autobiography type thing this is the story of a happy marriage so I've not read any of her novels um there's loads I really really want this is starting off with her childhood it then talks about um selling her first book her um owning her book a bookshop in Nashville like anything that's to do with someone owning a bookshop I'm up for that and her happy marriage although it does say her eventual happy marriage um an irresistible blend of literature and memoir so yeah I love stuff like this um incidentally this is really grubby, this book. This is one of the ones that was reduced, I think, because it was grubby. And mostly because it had this sticker on the spine. Um, I need to get a just a rubber from a, you know, a set of pencils to get that off. If you're ever having trouble with stickers, some bookseller tips, because um, they do drive me mad. And they're on everything now because everything is reduced. So the, the best thing, if you, if you take off a sticker and there's that tackiness underneath, uh, just keep the sticker on your hand and use the sticker. Don't use your fingers or try and pick at it. It'll just get worse. Use the sticker to get the stickiness away. Um, and it pretty much clears up. It's it's easier to do on hardbacks. It's always easier to do on hardbacks. Um, if like this, there is, I've managed to get the residue away, but it's still grubby. Use a rubber um, to try and get that, or an eraser, depending on what you call them, to try and get that away. Um, the other, if, if it's not peeling off at all, you know, when it comes off in shards, um, the best thing to do is to soak it with a little bit of water. So you need to get like a cloth and then squeeze the cloth out and just lay the cloth on there. And it is a little bit of a risky business type thing. To do. It's easier with hardbacks again. Um, you need to soften that glue up to get this, the stuff off. And then the final thing that will clear off any of the residue um, with, with a sticker that's really stuck is a bit of furniture polish. When it goes that fizz and it does that, that foam, um, if you sort of rub that in with your finger and then use a cloth, it will come off. Top tips from booksellers that uh, how many stickers I've peeled off in my life and put back on again, I cannot tell you. Um, one of my favourite sayings that one of my colleagues, Richie, used to say when I, when I was um, just a Christmas temp, he used to say, if there's time to talk, there's time to sticker. <laughs> and he's not wrong. 
So I got another lovely book. This was a gift from my friend Francesca. This is Alan Gwenot and Frieda by John Pikoulis. Um, and this is a biography about the um, poet and short story writer Alan um, Lewis. I almost forgot his surname then. And uh, this is a, a, like a, a story about the love triangle that existed between him and his wife Gwenot and Frieda, who was a woman he met when he was in India um, on active service in the Second World War. Now, Alan Lewis is an interesting figure, not just because his stuff is really good, but because he, he was a, a man who had very serious bouts of depression. Um, his death is kind of, even though he died in 1939, no, 41, um, and he was on active service, it's a bit of a mystery as to how he, he, he was, as far as I know, he, he died from a bullet from his own gun, but there's debate about whether he fell and you know all this kind of thing um I, I think this book's going to be really interesting just talking about the relationship between Frida and Gwenor that's who I really care about how they dealt with um his infidelity so yeah I am really looking forward to that um this was another sale book this is Alice Roberts the Un incredible unlikeliness of being evolution in the making of us um this I think she wrote just after she had her first child and she became really interested in you know how children grow and whatnot um she separated it into body parts um and then so you're talking about evolution and our ancestors and and the future i think so yeah i think that's going to be really good if you look her up if you don't know who alice roberts is she is the coolest british historian ever, um, and scientist ever she's a an anthropologist i think by trades and an anatomist as well she's a professor She's quite young. She looks kind of hippy dippy. She's got henna hair a lot of the time. She's got um, she hasn't got a plummy English accent. She's got um, I'm trying to think what region her accent is. I'm not actually sure, but it's just so pleasant on TV to see somebody with an accent that isn't Queen's English. And she's just you know massively knowledgeable and very easy to watch. And then the most the book I'm most excited about, and I remember seeing this when it was full price. Um, is Andrew Solomon's Far From the Tree, Parents, Children and the Search for Identity. So what, um, if you looked at the reviews on the outside of this book, you'd be like, well, why have I never heard of it? What, I mean, maybe you guys have. This is, must be the best book that's ever been written because more or less all of them say that. They say it's um, unique, that it's a book that you feel enlarged by. It's, it's the most extraordinary book I've read. My favourite review is, you don't so much read Far From the Tree as cohabit with it. Its stories take up residence in your head and heart, messily unpack themselves and refuse to leave. Um, he is talking about fatherhood um, initially. He talks about his son and he talks about being a father, which I think is really refreshing because there's not enough of stuff about that. But then he separates the differences. And I say that, um, I don't know how he phrases it in here. It's not massively clear from the outside until you sort of delve in. But he, he he looks at the differences of children from from what would be considered the norm. So he looks at things like deafness, Down syndrome. Um, he looks at things like prod being a, a child prodigy. Um, there's also a chapter on rape, so I'm not 100% sure how that's going to figure. Um, there's a chapter on being transgender. And he he uses them as a springboard to talk about well as the guardian put it it ends up being an affirmation of what it is to be human so i don't think this is one of those books that i've bought essentially because i'm a mum and it draws me to it but actually i think it would be good for everybody it is enormous like the notes are, the notes are enormous there we go but the actual book is bang on 700 so I think we'll have to wait till War and Peace is done before I tackle that. So one thing I did, based on your comments, can I just say, I've just got a sight of my reflection in one of the frames. Are you loving my woolen mum cardigan? And then like my like my, my sweat top. <laughs> it's like a classic mum combo of dressing one way and then being like, no, I need more layers. <laughs> I do apologise. I think the days have gone now where I like do my hair and put on something nice um yeah after my last video quite a few of you and i haven't responded to everyone's comments yet because i've been working all weekend um quite a few of you told me that maybe i should ditch this and i absolutely took your advice and i contacted britta and sean um sean was just desperately waiting for me to quit <laughs> so that she could join in as well um and we left britta to go it alone 
and I believe Britta has read the book and reviewed it so I haven't actually watched that video yet as I say I've been working um so we were clearly holding her way back because we we were only like 170 pages in and then like I think it was within 24 hours <laughs> Britta had finished the whole thing um so the in another life I might have tried to read it all the way through but um, things being as they were, the main reason why I just couldn't carry on anymore, and all of your reasons were excellent, by the way, saying that, you know, there's better things you could be reading, you shouldn't feel bad, if it's dragging you down and putting you in a reading slump, just give it up. I agree. But I think the thing that absolutely tipped me over the edge was just her, her snobbery and her humble bragging, which it got to the point where it was not just um, an accident. It's obviously what she's like a little bit. And it annoyed me so much that actually I've gathered together all of the other books I have of hers, some of which I've read and some of which I haven't. And I'm going to give them away. And I know that's controversial. I know you, you guys all know that I'm really into trying to get rid of books at the minute. But I have in the last month really tried to slow down and think, come on, like, are you that desperate to lower your bookshelves, that the, lower the content in your bookshelves that you're going to give everything away? So I have tried... I mean, it's just classic me to do something whole hog and to go completely the other way and then to go back and do it that way. So this isn't me trying to just jettison books. This is that she has just irritated me so much. And I'll, I'll really briefly tell you that like the last anecdote that she shared in this desire to find the difference between mind and body was being at a conference, which she was giving a paper at. Not a necessary part of the story, but she will not miss an opportunity to tell you if she's done something like that. Um, and somebody gave a paper that was really bad, she thought, and that had dismissed a lot of other evidence. And when it came to any questions, and if you've ever been to a conference, when you give a paper, you fully expect that everybody will actually not ask you a question. They'll just give themselves like a 10 minute platform to tell you what they think which totally defeats the point of it being any questions. It's so irritating. And she does that. She gives a little speech about how awful the paper was, corrects this person on all the things that they said wrong. And then she ends, and she even says this, ends with a rhetorical question. And that just made me laugh out loud because, like I say, if you go to a conference, there are always people who just want to steal the floor for like five or ten minutes at a time after this person has given their paper. And then because they realise that they were meant to ask a question at the end, they just sort of fumble at the last minute and then they just say this fairly pointless question to try to justify the fact that they've stood up and given a speech. That's exactly what she does. And apart from anything else, she openly says that this person is mortified. She just humiliates a person unnecessarily. Like, there's no need to do it like that. You could have asked a leading question. You could have said, have you read this paper? Because actually, that doesn't tend to fit in with what you've just said. What are your thoughts? She doesn't do any of that. She just wants to pull this person down. And I think the reason for her telling that anecdote was to talk about the fact that she felt guilty afterwards. And I was like, do you? <laughs> do you feel guilty because you're talking about it now and you seem pretty chuffed so yeah bye Siri I feel so bad like I've honestly collected her books for like the last 10 years so I do feel quite bad so now I've got a little bit of room I'm still doing War and Peace but I've got a little bit of room for my buddy reads um I've got two this month I've got Slayer the um book from the Buffy Vampire the Vampire Slayer world um that is a teen read and I if you can sneakily see my bookmark, don't be mad, Sean. Okay, this is who I'm reading it with. And we hadn't, we'd said April, but we hadn't said go. But I have read a little bit. I'd read a little bit last week and I read a little bit this morning. Just because I've got a massive buddy read with Mercedes this month. And I needed to get one of them done because I can't multi-read. It's just driving me mad. We'll talk about it when you're ready. <laughs> um... This is the monster that I'm reading with Mercedes, Waterfall of Stars, Waterfalls of Stars by Roseanne Alexander, my 10 years on the island of Skoma. So to my knowledge, Skoma is off the coast of Wales, but now I'm saying that, I'm not actually sure. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, geography's not my strong point. And she, Roseanne Alexander, was with her boyfriend. I think they were at university or they'd recently graduated and he got a job as the warden of Skoma, which was like a 10, I don't, I don't know if it comes as a 10 year position. I mean, presumably you could quit earlier than that, but they spent 10 years. And I think after 10 years, you have to go um, and because it's so isolated. I and mean, they're the only ones on there. Um, 
looking after the birds. They've got no internet, no electricity, nothing. They're looking after the birds and I think they're also sort of partially responsible for the seal population and just keeping everything ticking over. Um, I mean, I mean, this is the thing we all say, isn't it? You know, I want to leave the real world and just, you know, live on an island or live in a commune or whatever. But this is actually doing it. This is actually going out and living on a rock in the sea. And what does what does that do to you? So I am really excited to see, um, especially as they were such a young couple when they went over there and they kind of had to they had to be married in order to do the job together. So they had to rush out and get married and stuff like that. So I think it will be a really interesting story about their relationship. The book has tiny writing. Uh, so I'm frightened. I'm a little bit frightened as to how long it's going to take. And I have skim read books in the last couple of months. I think I was telling you. I can't skim read that. It won't be giving it a fair chance. Um, yes. Now, what I'm meant to be doing this morning while Stephen is out with Idris is I'm meant to be gardening and I'm not clearly not doing that because I'm talking to you. Um, I have been really busy in the garden. That's another reason that I didn't mention last time that my reading has taken a bit of a slump just because there's been other stuff that needed to be done. And um, so I've planted loads of seeds that my um, phone is balanced on top of a plant propagator that is filled with cosmos which is a really nice flower if you don't know what it is have a look it's really beautiful um and i've got to get out and do some now but what i have been reading um yeah and reading literally a page at a time when idris is playing around me is i've been reading monty don's the complete gardener so if you don't like gardening i can understand why this book might not interest you but monty don himself is really interesting um he's a british gardener english he has suffered from depression for most of his life, as far as I know, and he finds a, he finds therapy in gardening. And he's talked about it a lot on, on television. I don't know if he's released a book about it, but he certainly talks about it a lot on TV. Um, he's really into organic lifestyle. He's recently gone plastic free as much as possible. So he does a, a programme every weekend called Gardener's World. Um, on the BBC if you wanted to look it up and he relentlessly bangs on about plastic like I'm impressed at how he doesn't care how annoying it gets he just keeps talking about it um, and this is kind of his catch-all you know um, I'm going to tell you about shrubs I'm going to tell you about paths I'm going to tell you about carrot fly the lot but what's really amazed me is he's a really good writer and he's very eloquent when he speaks so I suppose it shouldn't surprise me but genuinely, I think his prose, considering he doesn't need, doesn't need, I'm trying to find a really good bit. You know, it, 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 this is kind of like a how-to thing. You think you're reading it for the facts, but actually I've really gotten caught up in this world that he's created. And um, I, <laughs> I read this bit to Stephen, so it's really, really, I, I know some of you hate being read to. It's really short. And then I'll tell you what Stephen said when I read it to him. Um, Whatever the season, morning sun is thin and clear. Looking through it is like pressing your cheek against a cool pane of glass. Colours float and change inside it. Strength exposed as vulgarity and intensity transformed into brashness. OK, so I think I read it to him like that. And his resp <laughs> response was to say deadpan, which I can't do because it was too funny. Um, I'm sure he's a very good lover. <laughs> was what he said in response. I mean... What has the world come to when a girl can't appreciate a bit of prose from a corduroy clad gardener without it being turned into something sexual? It's just, it's awful. So yeah, I'm not allowed to mention Monty because um, apparently I have a crush. Um, and Stephen watched Gardener's World without me um, on the weekend. So he didn't even tell me, he just watched it when I was putting Idris to sleep. So. <laughs> I'm obviously on a Monty Don ban. Um, but I do have to go out and put some of his ideas into practice now. Otherwise, when Stephen comes home, he's going to be like, what have you been doing? So I hope you're all really well. And um, I'm sorry I was on a bit of a downer in my last video. I just hate it when I can't read. It makes me so miserable. And I just felt like I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But now I've ditched Sir Siri. There's a little bit there's a little bit more light. So um, I hope your reading week's going really well and you're enjoying the weather, whatever it is with you. Let me know if you've read any of those books I've mentioned. Let me know if you're gardening. And if you've got any gardening books that you recommend, I would love to know. And I will speak to you soon. Bye.